Hey, welcome international community. This is very exciting. Uh, as you know, I'm a devotee of United Plan Savers. Um, so I'm very, very excited um, that they have uh, carried on the tradition of the International Air Symposium. Uh, my name is Kat Meyer, and I am coming to you from uh, the blooming Charlottesville, Virginia. I have forests of golden seal and blue cohosh are coming up. I have a downtown botanical sanctuary. Uh, so it's very, very exciting. And I'll miss being there. I'm usually uh, at the sanctuary in April for board meetings. I've had the honor of being on the board as well as president. Uh, so I heartily, heartily encourage um, as things open up and you feel really safe that it truly is a sanctuary. It's such a profound sanctuary in Ohio. So, so without further ado, uh, I am a clinical herbalist. I have a, I've been practicing for 30 years. I have a three-year clinical training where we've had a free clinic on the East Coast for many, many, many years. Um, I've had the honor of traveling around the East Coast and really helping people set up the template for how to run a, a really uh, a good clinic uh, with integrity and um, honoring um, all different uh, diversity and uh, different intakes and all of what's important today. So yeah, so I'm coming to you uh, from a clinical background and um, this is part of, I use, a, I use a blend. I use a blend of different energetics and we're gonna uh, talk more about that as we get in. But this is Western energetic herbalism. And before I do that, I just really wanna acknowledge sacred space and sacred space being the plants. You know, These are our profound teachers. Many people call them allies now. But what I'm coming to realize is they are not my equal. I am not their equal. What I see plants do within the sphere of the human consciousness is beyond belief. So they're my teachers now. I've The older I get, the wiser I get, and the smaller I get in relationship to the plants. Um, so I really wanna honor these sentient beings who are absolutely brilliant. And also that I am living on the unceded land of the Monacan nation. And so just as our first teachers were the plants, uh, then came First Nations. So just really acknowledging um, those that have um, held this as sacred ground. Um, so when we're looking at energetic medicine, you know, energetic medicine, um, I, I'm really verbose about it right now because I'm writing a book called Energetic Herbalism. And what I'm looking at are the different patterns and energy in our Western language is called vitality, vital energy. Uh, Chinese call it qi, uh, Ayurveda calls it prana, uh, Iroquois calls it ovrinda, you know, ashe. There's many, many languages, but it's life. It's that spark of life. And so what happens is energy in our bodies creates patterns just as we're the microcosm of nature. And so wind creates a pattern in land, water creates a pattern, heat creates a pattern. And so why I'm devoted to energetic herbalism is it really is a direct sensory experience into our environment. You know, we have one amazing challenge in front of us and the only thing in front of us really is climate change. For me, that tops all, all, justice systems because we really need to protect those who are incredibly vulnerable to climate change. And so as plant people, it's for me, if we can understand energetics, if we look at our patterns, we can really help and move through this. For example, it's going to get hotter. It's getting hotter. Heat is heat. How do we work with a pattern of heat? What does heat do in our bodies? And so we're going to be looking at that. So we're really looking at patterns here. Vitalism is uh, vital energy, uh, clear, bright, active, warm. It's what activates us. Um, when a person's vital energy is strong and healthy, they feel, feel clear and bright. Um, and, you know, I've trained in Chinese medicine. 
I've trained in Ayurvedic medicine. And what I love about vitalism is, you know, I can say, oh, you have chi, chi stagnation or spleen chi stagnation. Uh, and that sets up a hierarchy. You know, my community, my clients may not know what that means and feel inferior in a way as often happens in allopathy. I also want to say I'm a trained allopath. I'm a physician assistant. Absolutely am a recovering scientist. I adore science. I think it's the language of the sacred. Um, for me, I don't do plant spirit medicine, sacred medicine, and scientific medicine. For me, they're one and the same. Science is the language of the sacred. So when we're looking at languaging and reaching folks, you know, it's like, oh, I can say your vitality. Well, you look really vital today. So they understand that. And, and that's even almost a transference of energy for that. So the tissue states, this is a little hard to see. And I will be sending the PowerPoints and a slide. So in whatever form, you will get all these slides. Um, but Galen uh, was a, a Greek physician, uh, and he acknowledged, actually, it was Hippocrates who began with the four qualities of hot, cold, damp, and dry. And they were the four qualities that represent energetics. And then later on, um, two more tissue states uh, were added, uh, tension and relaxation. And um, these are the tissue states that Matthew Wood has brought forward from physiomedical texts. It's really important when we're telling history, right? The physiomedicalist tissue states were based in a bit of a more arcane, a more archaic language based on the nervous system. So what Matthew did was he brought forward to make it more understandable for contemporary folks and then intention and relaxation, because we're all striving for relaxation. But relaxed tissue state means it has no tension. So our magnificent Jim McDonald has brought the word lax um, into our use. So that's what I will be using. So these are the tissue states that we'll be looking at. And it's really important to realize this is a spectrum. This is not, this is a continuum. You don't wake up one day and all of a sudden you're now cold. Something was going on, and we're going to talk about that. But I just want to give a quick example. For example, mono. You know, I have a, a tremendous number of clients who had mono when they were younger, and every, they trace everything back to beginning with mono. And so our Western culture thinks it's benign. Just rest, just sleep, and you'll be fine. Well, a month later, after severe fatigue, you're not, your vitality just took a great hit. What we as herbalists do is we'll follow in with mono, we'll work with antivirals, we'll work with, you know, the immune system, and then afterwards we use convalescence. We'll warm the body, we'll bring vitality in so that they're maybe even better than before. But what happens is after mono in our usual culture, you go along, life's fine, maybe you're pregnant, maybe you take a hit and chronic fatigue comes on. Chronic fatigue is Epstein-Barr. It is the virus that causes mono. And so you might have chronic fatigue and get over that, and then you get into further trouble with, say, hypothyroid. And now we have this hypothyroid epidemic. It's loss of fire. It's loss of vitality. So a vitalist, whether you're acupuncturist, Ayurvedic, you know, you see somebody going through a cold, deficient condition, um, and you go in and warm them up. So for me, that's why energetics totally rocks, because we treat what we see. And that's the mantra in my clinic. Treat what you see. Seeing is listening. It's all about senses. It's a very sensual practice. So um, so these aren't oppositions. These are along a continuum. You know, we have hot, uh, it goes up, it expands. It's warming the interior. Warm has an upward energy as well, but it's more supportive. Neutral, there's a flavor in herbalism is bland and it serves us. Oftentimes they're diuretics, but they go right through to the kidneys and they have a purpose. Cooling herbs move downward. Nettles, 
Nettles is cold. It's cooling. You know, if you're drinking a lot of nettles, that's downward energy. Yes, it's a diuretic, but if you run cold, you may want to warm up that nettles. Um, so here are the flavors. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I kind of added more info that you would have for your slides, but what I really want to do is um, get to the plants and get through the tissue states. Um, this is in some ways, a three-month course, um, but we're bringing it to you live, uh, just condensing it. Um, so Thurston is the physician who was a physio, physio medicalist who uh, distilled these tissue states. And so heat, we're going to start with the temperature. There's three qualities, temperature, moisture, and tone. So for temperature, we're not talking about fever, although heat will present that way. We're talking about overexcitation. We're talking about wakefulness, restfulness, overexcited. ADD is heat. Um, hyperthyroid is heat. You know, what are the remedies for hyperthyroid? Lemon balm, motherwort, cooling remedies. Um, I'm not going to get into tongue and pulse, I just want to keep this as more of a general information. Um, but when we're looking at heat, this is what we want to do is we want to look at the cooling formulas. So if we look at fever, you know, look at the classic fever formula, elderflower, peppermint, and yarrow. And so, yes, they're cooling. They're very cooling. Um, some of them are downward. But, you know, in our clinic, what we do is we do uh, provings and tastings. And um, so the clinic students arrive, um, even foundational students, but it's really much more directed with clinical students. They arrive. We have a huge urn of tea. They don't know what the tea is. And we do a proving. Where does it go on the tongue? What's the flavor? What's the direction? Doing a meditation, where is it going? Uh, what are the images that are conveyed? So it's almost a Gertian study, if you will, um, looking at the whole plant. And what's profound is when you do this, and I highly recommend you do this with your herb nerds or by yourself or really get to know the herbs one at a time. I mean, you go to a, a total rock show, right? And there's tons of people and how are you going to meet everybody? But it's that one-on-one -on -one walk through the woods where you, you really become intimate. So instead of blends of herbs until you really know them, I, I highly recommend you spending a week with elderflower. Just drink elderflower for a week and just notice that. So what's cool about elderflower when you sit there, it's like, wow, you know, it's this energy outward. And even if you're not fevering, you're going to feel it. That's the energy of Sambucus. It's moving outward. So if I'm fevering, I already have this balance that I want to attend. So my body is going to open up the windows for this herb to push things out. And that's breaking a fever. Um, so the, the flower is different, fresh or dried, um, but elder is really, really powerful remedy for clearing heat. Yarrow, you know, we could study yarrow for our life and it's, you know, called the master of blood and um, it's it powerful. I, this is my go-to diaphoretic. Um, just very, very powerful and you want to make a, a pretty strong infusion adults need to get in hot water. Children fever really quickly and well because they have so much vitality and young. And as we age, we need to kind of get behind in either sauna or steam. But drinking, you know, even just for cleansing, it's springtime, it's cleansing. We don't think of this as the time of um, uh, sweating, but that's clearing out the winter's debris. You'll be watching this in the summer. Um, or maybe you'll be watching it in the winter. I don't know. Uh, that's the great part about watching online. But for me right now is this spring energy. Um, so yarrow moves blood um, to or from the surface to cool. That's how we cool our body, by sweating. Um, so there's mint. Uh, we've talked about that, clearing wind. This is my... Uh, little commercial to say, do not go uh, getting plant ID online. This happens to me over and over. I'll go to get a picture for a PowerPoint. Um, but I was searching for self-heal and up comes 
uh, this is actually bee nettle. This plant does not like to be called dead nettle because it's not dead and it's not a nettle. It's a lamium and the bees love it. So we call it bee nettle. And I was looking for prunella, self-heal. Um, so get, get your good botany books and get out there with the plants. So self-heal, it's a mint, it's a weed. This is a profound remedy for clearing heat. I use it as poultices, I use it in infections, I use it with MRSA. Um, it's, it's specifically for tonsillitis. There's a doctrine of signatures and that's a 16th century Paracelsus uh, is saying that there's a signature of the plant that's indicating uh, the organ that it's used for, but it goes beyond. There's a cosmology. When you do plant spirit work, when you meet the spirit of the plant, there's an architecture. There's a, a signature, if you will. So I love self-heal. Who doesn't love the name Prunella? I mean, I love her. Um, so Baikal, Skullcap, uh, it's been coming into our realm more and more. Uh, I'm a huge fan of using local plants. I can grow Baikal now and I can get the seeds locally. Um, but this is from a Baikal. It's from um, Siberia. And uh, the root is used and it's fabulous for clearing heat. Bronchitis, um, I've used it in some of the COVID formulas I've been working with that were kind of hard to treat, um, that they were, they were just having a hard, where, where they were deficient and they didn't have the vitality um, to clear the heat by themselves. I found Baikal a really nice addition. Viola, sweet, mineral, salty, mucilaginous, cool and moist, uh, great for dry atrophy. Um, it's a demulcent. I'm not going to explain all these terms, but it's very, very moistening. And the thing with heat is it dries. Um, and so whenever you're treating the um, tissue state of heat, you always want to go in and look for uh, what's the moisture level. So here are herbs that cool the blood, um, echinacea, marshmallow. I'm going to go through a few different categories of toxic heat and... Um, I mean, a, a few categories of heat because heat is the most destructive. You know, cold is just cold and damp and sluggish. And it's like pitta when that fire pitta is out of balance. Fire is the most destructive. So that's what you want to treat first. And there's a, a number of different heats. So toxic heat is intense, toxins, sores, abscesses. And so echinacea, and you know, echinacea is not the premier cold and flu formula because it's cold medicine, which is why it's great for snake bites. We have a lot of copperhead snake bites. Now you get a, a, a bite from a copperhead and they'll send you home from the hospital and we've been treating them for years, but there's so many anaphylactic reactions now. Um, but this is, clears toxic heat, spider bites, recluse spiders. Echinacea is a profound medicine for deep, deep sepsis. Um, so ulcerative pharyngitis, putrefaction. If you do use echinacea, which sometimes it is um, for a flu because it's building, it, it's a tonic, um, not for long term, but not because of why the Germans say, but warm it up. Like if you really want to use echinacea and you have a cold, then warm it up with ginger um, or a warming herb. Uh, trifolium pretense, fabulous for clearing um, deep heat. Plantain, uh, you know, the, if I, I, have, uh, I have friends who they'll do everything with plantain. Um, I work a lot with the unhoused. We work a lot with educating people on the streets. And plantain, it's antimicrobial, anti-infective, um, diarrhea, ulcerative colitis. Uh, a lot of these folks have pretty serious GI issues. Um, it's great for leaky gut. It's profound for leaky gut. So if they have infections and they get on antibiotics or if they're diabetics, uh, plantain is a very, very powerful herb and clears heat. Um, so golden seal root, um, I, you know, in my book, my materia medic was only 25 plants because I think we have to really begin to look at our apothecaries and, and hone them in. And I think COVID was a, a trial run in a way. We ran out of so many herbs and, you know, we looked local. 
So I, Golden Seal, I have a small, beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. I wish, oh, actually, I will be doing a plant tour um, as another class here, but I have Golden Seal taking over. Um, so I include Golden Seal because it's very, very easy to propagate, very easy to grow. I sort of have a nursery for my students. We dig up the roots and we separate and we give away. Um, and UPS has a great giveaway. Um, yellow dock, Oregon grape. Oregon grape is in the berberine family and berberine is cooling and clearing heat. Um, the bitters, of course, I'm sure that, you know, you have lots and lots of classes on bitters. I'm not going to spend time here. Um, but our bitters are cooling and clear heat. And whenever I travel and go to the tropics, I always travel with bitters because when you go from a temperate zone, which is sort of dry, and you go into a tropical, it's damp and moist, and it proliferates life. So a lot of times you don't get bacterial infections just because of the different ecosystem and the different bacteria. It's also because you entered into a whole other environment. It's a terrain. In tissue states treats the terrain. So bitters are drying and they're cooling and I love traveling with them. When I was visiting and hanging out with Rosita Arvigo, you know, I would use her jackass bitters. And what I like to do when I travel is go to the local bitters, you go to the market, and that's always very exciting. Every locale has bitters um, and they're clearing heat. Summer heat, this makes sense. Uh, watermelon, cucumber, uh, this is from too much sun, too much, uh, and we look at the refrigerant herbs, and this is hibiscus, uh, but I got to say, watermelon, I had food poisoning once that I kind of wished I would die, if you've ever had one of those great, wonderful events, and this woman gave me watermelon, and I'm telling you, it was manna from heaven. I could not believe how quickly it cleared the heat, cleared the toxins, and I have been a devotee ever since. Um, so looking at the rose family, this also clears heat. Uh, hawthorn, rose hips, peach, a sumac. I love our sumac, and I have a picture of that. A trophic heat is when it's too dry. You know, when this is like cancer, chemo, uh, radiation. Radiation is pure heat right? So if you're going in for radiation, what I do a lot is I'll, I'll have people delay it if they can, and we'll moisten them and build their yin and really get them juicy and juiced up because the radiation is so heating and drying. Um, so it's, um, you clear the heat, but in radiation you can't because that's the therapy. And then you restore nutrition. That's with our demulsants, and we're going to get into dry and atrophy, so I'll speak more about that, our beautiful marshmallow. So moving on to the tissue state of cold depression, um, this is under activity. Just as heat was too much activity, cold here is under activity. It doesn't have to mean you're cold, but generally when vital energy is low, that is what happens. And so this is your stimulants. These are your pungent aromatics, your volatile oils, uh, the bitter aromatics of the sesquiterpenes and the triterpenes. Um, so this is your mustard, your brassica family, a horseradish, all of the herbs on your digestive uh, spice rack. Um, are there to um, remove cold dampness. In Chinese medicine, the pernicious climate of stomach and spleen, earth element is dampness. And so there's nothing worse for your digestive fire first thing in the morning to have a cold smoothie because your fire is just waking up and you want to get that agony going. And if you take a nice cold smoothie, you can do that while you're young and you can get away with all kinds of things when you're young, but just know that smoothies are fabulous, uh, but you want to take them later on in the day. Um, they're a great way to get nutrition, but just looking at that temperature. So with digestion, we really want to be warming them up. We don't want it damp. So warming the interior, respiratory, you know, this is from our beautiful garden, the, the thyme, rosemary, oregano, um, cayenne, cinnamon. 
Uh, these are the warming. Th this is what we use all the time in our diet because that is what brings on really good digestion. So again, going to the spice rack is where we really want to be for cold depression. Uh, you warm the interior, ginger, black pepper, fennel, um, angelica, archangelica. I'm a huge fan of prickly ash bark, xanthoxylum. What an intense, beautiful tree. Um, I use prickly ash a lot. Um, it's set you on peppers. Um, it's a different species in China, uh, but it's so incredibly medicinal. So more warming herbs and saunas. I just think we have the lost art of sauna. Um, if you look at Samuel Thompson, if you go back uh, in indigenous uh, train in indigenous healings, you know it's the sweat lodge. Now the sweat lodge is a sacred ceremony. Uh, that we're, we're really becoming aware of, of appropriation and whose ceremony and whose medicine. Um, so, but the Temescal in, in the Mayans, every single tradition has had sweat therapy uh, because that's what they understand is, you know, fire is life, uh, warmth is life, and cold is death. So back to the Egyptians, thousands and thousands of years ago, the use of sauna and heat um, has been really helpful. You know, a lot of the ha long haulers in COVID, um, I see is the one of the problems is that stuck. It's stuck uh, heat, and I really think if people with possibly with long haul, long term symptoms with COVID could get into a sauna, could bring on a good sweat, it would really open the courses and really help the lymphatics. Um, so defensive energy, when we're cold, we get sick, right? I'm tired, I'm stressed, I'm vulnerable. That's that defensive energy. And cinnamon really works on the interior. So moving into dry atrophy, um, I just want to take a minute here um, and check on slides. Um, so the dry atrophy that we're looking at is, um, we talk about heat, right? Heat dries, wind dries. You know, native peoples all around the world rarely built on mountaintops because it was super windy. And wind has pernicious in influences. It is very drying, it's kind of disturbing. Um, so wind can dry. Um, it's not just hydration, it's also oils and good oils. Um, sometimes it's not because we're not hydrating enough, but we're not holding on to those oils. We may not be breaking them down. You know, if I, I'm a, a huge fan of plant oils, I think we're over harvesting the oceans. Uh, yes, we can go get the cleanest and best Norwegian fish for EPA and DHA, but, but we're doing the same thing to the oceans that we're doing to our plants. You know, krill is vital, vital food for whales. And we've just seen that horrible event of whales beaching, dying, and some of it was malnutrition. It wasn't just fishing. So we have to leave the krill for, for the whales and being my, I can't tell you what to do. I can sort of emphasize that, you know, as healers and plant people and earth stewards, like let's really follow the source of what we're eating, what we're taking and that's plants and it's krill and leave it in the ocean. Uh, we've got to find other ways um, to, to really supplement oils and, uh, and why do we need so many oils? Let, let's, let's go upstream. Let's go upstream and see, well, why are we so dry? Um, so the symptoms of dryness, bloating and gas and constipation and insomnia. And I'll tell you, when you work energetically, people are just going to be on their knees grateful because I can't tell you how many people I see, they'll come in and they'll say, oh my God, I have like six different things and my joints are cracking and I have bloating and I'm constipated and my skin's so dry and they have one issue. You know, they're dry. So we want to moisten them and bring them hydration 
And the interesting thing is stress or adrenaline is very heating. Um, I just realized I'm looking at my webcam the whole time and the webcam's not on. That's so funny. So um, adrenaline is supposed to move our bodies. It, it, it's fight or flight. We want to run. We want to um, pump our heart. And so adrenaline is heating. And that heat, when it stays in our systems um, day in and day out, that's what dries us. I mean, that's what inflammation is. The whole tissue state of heat is inflammation. So I treat cholesterol as a heat condition. It's oxidative breakdown. And look at the remedies for cholesterol. It's the antioxidants, right? It's the proanthocyanidins. It's all the berries. It's all the green tea. It's the cooling fruits that'll cool the heat from the inflammation of cholesterol. Cholesterol is our endogenous antioxidant. Cholesterol is not the issue. You stop the production of cholesterol and the fire rages on. So I give classes, I, I'm, I'm passionate about um, statin drugs and you know the repercussions of them and that high cholesterol, yes, you don't want high cholesterol, um, but there's something else going on. So the heat causes the dryness and what's interesting is statin drugs will cause something called rhabdomyolysis. And that's because it works in the liver and it stops the production of CoQ10. And that creates this muscle pain and this muscle dryness. Um, so the different ways that we can work um, with hydration are the oils, um, plant oils, black cumin oil. Um, uh, what's the nigella um you know that that has great great promising incredible research going on with that uh black currant borage oil and then our vegetable oils um whether that's coconut oil um, olive oil you know i i think it's important when we get really good olive oil that alone um is our medicine um we look at italians we look at you know they're they're heat, you know, they're a heated genotype. And yet, you know, what is it in their diet that really enables them to, to have, maintain the health that they have? So these are the demulcent herbs that we're going to be looking at for hydrating and uh, moistening tissues. And there's this reflex, you know, it's like this crazy thing. It's like, well, how do I drink this marshmallow tea and it gets to my dry skin or my dry intestine? But it's too long of a topic, but it's brilliant. It's this reflex action in our mucous membrane, in our gut lining. Um, it's a, a whole communication network, um, but it works. I mean, tr uh, fenugreek. I mean, I mean, fenugreek. If I, I love it for depression. I use fenugreek a lot for depression because it's blood sugar. You're balancing blood sugar. And and folks that are on fenugreek for a long time, I I love the smell. They kind of smell like um. Um, a Moroccan uh, marketplace because it's that uh, very sensual smell of spices and fenugreek. Uh, but it's going through their body. It, it, it's exhumed through their lungs. That's how garlic is one of the most potent medicines for our lungs because it, it comes through with that. So mullein and plantain and these moistening, moistening herbs um, you know, as a physician assistant, I never had the ability um, to, to work with states of the body like this. Um, here's um, where the school is down at Robbie Wooding's uh, herb farm, and I used it because there's Susan Leopold, um, our uh, fabulous UPS director. Um, in this slide, this is Robbie Wooding's herb farm, and, you know, we go down to the herb farm for a number of reasons, and Primarily, it's to really enlighten um, herb students that, all right, here's this slippery elm. I mean, he has some trees. We're not cutting them down. These are branches. Um, that tree that you can see behind Susan, that is, uh, you know, if you you could turn almost 180, and that's the most massive, massive pecan tree. 
This is um, hundreds of years of a family farm down here. And so what they have down there is such a treasure. But anyway, so we go down and you have to rasp the outer cortex. You draw blade the inner cambium. Then you strip them off the um, branch and then you dry it and you process it. And, you know, the whole idea is to show students how are, how, how can you pay $16 for a pound of black haw bark? You know, it's to really try to, to connect the dots that these plants uh, we have to be able to pay if we really want to walk our talk and support uh, local farmers, then we really have to pay. Um, because if you've ever harvested a pound of nettles, you know, how, how can you pay $8 a pound for that? So really being mindful of this. So I don't use Slibrium except um, for really advanced cancer folks that really need the nutrition. A slippery elm is so deeply nutritious and they can't take much in um, and slippery elm is moist and cooling and very nutritious um, these are oily herbs the burdock angelica osha uh, spikenard um, these, these this is a little more nuanced um, but they're building they're all the building. There's spikenard that's in the Aurelia. That's one of my favorite. You know, our, our eastern woodlands were just full, full of spikenard. Um, it's just such a treasure if you ever come upon one. So when we're looking at dry atrophy, this is when we're looking at the sweet tonics or the adaptogens. And we're, so why we need so many adaptogens today is from the stress, right? And so that stress will think we're fatigued and tired, but if you look energetically, you're, you're really gonna see signs of dryness. Um, and so I had a Chinese teacher a long time ago. Um, we were on the farm I lived on um, up in Rappahannock County and we were digging ginseng and he said, you know, if all you young people are taking ginseng, what are you gonna take when you're old? And so we've been hearing this from our teachers and our elders that, you know, adaptogens are wonderful. They're, they're profound medicines. Um, but there's, a, there's something else that has to happen um, to address our fatigue. And uh, easier said than done, right? But be really mindful that burdock and dandelion, I find them food herbs. I find them tonic herbs. You know, so before we jump right into the adaptogens, let's, let's really come back and uh, look at nervines. Let's look at trying to calm. And, uh, you know, I just took, like I said, I'm writing this book and there's a lot going on and you know, I, I had this shoulder tension and um, I just went down to my apothecary and took a little shot of blue vervain and uh, I just blue vervain, just dropping, just relaxing, just nerving, just kind of coming back into my body. And so sometimes if we come back into our body, we realize, oh, well, I'm really tired. I've got to stop. If we keep taking adaptogens and keep going, 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 then we're really going to get into organ trouble, organ deficiency. So these sweet tonics are sweet. Um, they're made from mucopolysaccharides, most of the roots, because that's about growth. Um, astragalus, licorice, uh, red raspberry, all of these. Um, astragalus, we can grow. Um, it's a vetch. Um, it's the root that's used, but it's a super, super sweet tonic, um, wonderful for the kidneys, very building, um, and great for lungs as well. Licorice, I've grown licorice. I've grown it next at a school we had, Dreamtime Center. We grew the licorice and the astragalus close together because they looked a lot alike, and we just wanted to see the rate of growth um, on them. I think they're both legumes. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, small, small amounts of licorice, right? Um, you don't need much at all, um, but it's very supportive. And again, um, these are drying. Bitters are drying, but this is my uh, plea to maybe relax before you uh, jump into some of the adaptogens. 
These are the steroidal saponins, the ginsengs, saw palmetto. Oh my God, I love saw palmetto. Um, it, we have to be careful of harvesting that now. Florida, fortunately, um, put legislature on it because the wildlife um, really needs saw palmetto. It's so incredibly nutritious. And our far nutraceutical industry, our saw palmetto supplements, you know, is just going down and harvesting tons and tons. And, and so I'm really, really grateful that um, they're keeping an eye on that for the wildlife. You know, the Trail of Tears was very intentional. The timing was intentional. They wanted to eliminate as many natives. And so they set them off at winter time. And um, what natives did, because they didn't have their usual foods, they um, picked up um, saw palmetto. And if you've ever smelled it or tasted it, it's kind of gnarly. Um, but what they did was they turned it into breads and flowers and um, it's not just for prostates. It's incredible food. I use it for women when they come to me and the hormonal uh, profile is their testosterone's too low and they don't want to take testosterone supplements. It's, I use saw palmetto. Um, it's building. It, it has incredible nutrients that way. So, um, damp stagnation. I know I'm kind of going a mile a minute, um, but you will have all the slides. You can come back and rewatch this. Um, so we went through uh, cold, uh, hot and cold, and uh, atrophy and dry, and now damp. And so damp um, is cold on steroids. Um, you, you rarely get to damp right away. You are usually running cold, kind of like that example that I used with the mono. Um, you've been running cold and now you just don't have the vital energy. Um, and that's candida. You know, candida is dampness. It's turbid. Um, it's sort of like this pond. It's the algae. It's, um... Uh, fluids cannot get out of normal channels of elimination. Uh, the backup can build up into catarrh, or phlegm, or mucus. Um, this is referred to as the humors, but, you know, the humors were, it's a little more complicated. Um, but this is bad blood. You know, Phyllis Light and her brilliant um, Southern folk medicine and um, traditional medicine is talking about bad blood. And... Um, you know, when I was studying in Belize with um, a teacher of Rosita's, Ms. Hortense, who is this amazing midwife, she was teaching that one way that they find uh, match herbs and a person is they will prick the blood of a person. Obviously, we can't do that with all the um, blood-borne diseases. Um, but they'll t prick the blood and then they'll mix that with the plant they think that they want to use it, and they'll see what the plant does to the blood, which is really pretty astounding. Um, so this is, this is toxins. This is metabolic uh, debris. This is diabetes. This is advanced stages of diabetes um, because look at the gangrenous ulcers. Um, they're stagnant. They're, there's no blood going down um, to the extremities. Uh, mentally, energy is like a clear light and damp is a heavy fog. This can be depression. Um, sometimes I clear, I work with depression simply energetically, you know, removing the turbidity. Um, and this is why the gut, right? We all know the microbiome of the gut is huge in mental health. Well, well, that, this is where it's coming in. It's looking at um, clearing this dampness. So this is where the quote-unquote blood cleansers come in. These are the alteratives. And for me, they alter our state of mind. And what they do is they enhance eliminatory function. They enhance urination, lymphatics, liver. Um, what they're doing is they're going in and they're supporting your own body um, to eliminate and to do what it needs to do. Our body's vitalism is exactly like James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis' theory of the Gaia hypothesis. And they said that the earth is a self-correcting mechanism, that it's constantly governing salinity and storms and winds. Our bodies are doing the same thing. So our herbs are supposed to just go in and gently nudge the body back into not homeostasis, 
because stasis, stasis doesn't exist in nature. It's homeodynamics. It's constantly moving. And you want it moving. You want it correcting. And so when we give blood cleansers and, you know, drink these incredibly nourishing teas and, you know, everybody's looking at intestinal cleanses, kidney cleanses, juniper berry, nettles, um, you know, really looking at the eliminatory organs. Um, so damp flowing, um, we'll get into that more with relaxation. When you're draining damp, um, these tend to be cool because you, it's more of a diuretic and there's this downward energy. Corn silk, dandelion leaf, um, plantain, all of these can really help clear. And that's, again, I just can't overemphasize plantain leaf for gut health. Um, it's cheap. You can go harvest your own. If you have dogs, make sure you wash it off. Um, but anyway, uh, resolve damp stagnation. These are the, um, aren't, you know, if you go to restaurants and they used to, they don't do it anymore. They give you an orange peel. Well, citrus used to remove damp stagnation. And we use something called, it's called Chen Pea, but we make our own. Whenever we can get organic tangerines, uh, we'll dry them and we'll tincture that. And green tangerines, it's just profound for that um, postprandial fullness, that after you've eaten, when you just feel like th there's just too much fullness. Or when you fall asleep, people that fall asleep after eating, um, that's indicative of too much dampness and you really want to uh, get that fire moving. Okay, we're down to two more. Hang in there. We've got two more here. And so the last two are tension and wind. Um, so this corresponds to those conditions that occur due to nervous tightening and spasm. And so this is psychological tension, mental tension, but it's also when its tissues are too taut and they can be taught for different reasons. Um, and it, like I said, uh, the nerves are involved and we want good tension. You know, it's like a guitar when you're, when you're tuning a guitar, um, you know, this is looking at the tone of the tissues. Um, so these are our acrid herbs. These are the kind of bitter nauseants, you know, the acrid plants that, uh, it's hard to take a tea of these. Um, I prefer most of these in tincture form. Valerian, I love catnip and chamomile as a tea, but cramp bark, um, I love black haw. I'm a huge fan of the viburnums um, as relaxants. Piper, methysticum, kava kava, you know, there's great uh, sources on Hawaii, great farms in Hawaii that um, can supply good quality kava. Um, just a profound, profound relaxant. And for me, this is of uh, like the first chakra. This is, you know, such a great relaxant of the pelvic region, low back pain, pelvic pain, endometriosis. Um, it's really hard to, to treat. And so I know that the Kavalatones uh, yield their medicine and pleasure and magic in fat. And so um, coconut milk and extracting it in uh, fat soluble uh, menstruums is preferred. Um, but I got to tell you, when I get a good kava root and I make a decoction, um, I can't believe that is legal. It's immediate. It's so relaxing. Um, it just really enables me to drop down into another place. And um, so again, I don't use a lot of it because um, it's not plentiful for me anyway. Um, but we have a, a lot of our viburnums. Um, skunk cabbage, it, you know, this was one of the first plants I learned. And you know what, I've been doing this for 30 years. And one of my first herbals was Jethro Claus back to eat. And I, I read that book cover to cover so many different times. And there was this great anti-spasmodic formula and it was skunk cabbage. And skunk cabbage, if it's in your area and it's plentiful, you just have to take a good amount of time and go dig that root because it you enter a whole other world. The root system is like Methuselah, it's profound. Be careful, it has um, crystals, it can be toxic on the skin, 
um, very, very accurate, but a profound. So this is my, you know, local kava in a way. They're all different. You know, I could never substitute a friend. You know, there are analogs for ginseng, but you know, ginseng is ginseng. Um, so, but it, but you do want to make sure that you look at your materia medica and say, well, well, what can I go get? And that's what you really want to learn how to use. Lobelia, I've taught classes on Lobelia, Poke. What was the other one? Um, I can't remember what the other one was. Maybe it was just Lobelia and Poke. When I lived in north of Charlottesville, there was a town called Front Royal. And Front Royal had this EPA um, toxic site. It was like the, the worst toxic site in the United States. And they made asbestos. They made, I think, military equipment or uniform, something horrible. And the Shenandoah River was killed for a mile. Um, just wretched, wretched pollution. And there was a ton of asthma there. And so um, I worked with Mennonites. And Mennonites were profound teachers for me because this was not alternative medicine for them. You know, they, they did not have, you know, if this doesn't work, I'm going to go to the doctor. So they would take me as far as they could. And they were so brave. And they just, you know, brought the reality of lobelia. It is... You know, Paul Bergener, if you really want to know about Lobelia, go to his medical herbalism journal and find his article on Lobelia, and he discounts every site of death from Lobelia. Herbalists keep citing erroneous passages. Lobelia has never killed anyone. It's an emetic. You're going to puke. Um, it, it, that's what it does. And so this was Samuel Thompson's herb. Um, and he would puke and purge. He would, you know, it was when they were thinking of the humors and they were trying to rid the body of humors and excesses. I've never, ever had any client use it as a purgative. It's an antispasmodic. It's so relaxing. It's very, very accurate. You don't need much at all. But for me, this is a plan of power. I mean, sort of like ayahuasca, you know, the, the, the psilocybin and ayahuasca and all of those visionary plants, they're the alkaloids. They're the, they're the bad boys of herbalism and they're about vision and you don't need much. It's not like you got to go back and do it over and over and over. It's like, wow, I had the vision. Okay, let me now go forward and put into play what I was just gifted. So I love Lobelia. It's local. It's fresh plant. When you tincture it, though, it's best in fresh plant. I go keep going. I got it. I got a motor on. Uh, but let me go back and say the one thing about, I don't know if you can see my um, pointer, but see these little seed pods here? Um, that's the seeds that you want to gather if you want to um, proliferate. But that's where the potent medicine is. And there's a uh, eclectic uh, physician cook. I think he used on a small boy uh, with serious, serious lung phlegm. I mean, people died of phlegm. Uh, he used a whole ounce of lobelia seed tincture in a day um, just to clear the phlegm. So, but the seed, so when I make seed tincture, I keep it separate. And then if you're just starting out and you're a little wary, just don't go with the leaves and keep the seed pods out because the seeds are what are most potent. Wild yam, you know, I don't, I, I don't find this to be a hormonal herb for me. For me, it's as um, antispasmodic for hollow tubes. So for passing gallstones, I'm not a big olive oil. I don't do that purge. Um, but equal parts lobelia and wild yam, taking 20 drops every uh, 20 minutes, a half hour, if gallstones are passing. It has a specificity for the cystic duct. Um, so I tell herbalists, you may not save lives, but you can save organs. And so we've saved many a gallbladder um, just to help the passage of stones because it's so incredibly painful. Oh, there's lobelia. Um, so you see those beautiful seed pods. Um, that's if when when they mature, they that you want to get them less green. Um, and you open it up and you'll see hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Um, and it's very easy to seed um, if you have a greenhouse. Um, and I have direct seeded it as well. Um, so wind is the severe advanced form of tension. Um, 
I love Blue Vervain um, for the wind. That was sort of what I was experiencing today. Just so much going on in um, Johnson & Johnson and side effects and, you know, lots of classes coming on and writing. And so I was like, oh, let me just slow this bit of a storm that's happening. Um, and I cannot tell you, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was a teaspoon, I could say a shot, maybe a little more. Might have been a, a little cordial there. Um, pretty effective for decreasing uh, wind. Um, so prickly ash, uh, tension wind, I'm saying. Um, agrimony. So here's the last state and here's lax. And this relaxation, this lax is a state of tension too little tension or another way of saying it is under control or under management. So this can be aging. This can be a prolapsed bladder. It can be prolapse. I mean, vital energy or chi, it holds things in place. I mean, it, it, we never even think about it. We never think, well, God, what, what's holding? It's not all ligaments. You know, the, we need vital energy to hold things in place. And so as we age, right, there's this whole giving into gravity and vital energy. And that's what my Chinese doctor teacher was saying. He said those yang tonics are for elders. They're longevity tonics. And if 20, 30-year-olds are digging young tonics, you know, something's, something's amiss. Um, so um, this is prolapse, leaking fluids. This can be leucorrhea, vaginal leaking. It can be spermatorrhea, um, premature ejaculation. It can be nocturnal. It can be bedwetting. Um, it's a releasing fluids um, prematurely, or there's not enough tone um, to hold on to that. Um, habitual miscarriage is seen um, as this state as well. Um, so these are the astringents. These are uh, the tannins. And, you know, the beautiful thing about tannins is almost every plant has tannins because it's the secondary metabolite because it's defensive for the plant. Um, tannins are part of the plant's immune system. And so every plant needs that. And so we have the spectrum, you know, from oak bark and oak galls. I think oak galls are like 90% galls are when the oak tree has an insect and it mounts a response and it, it like surrounds this insect and it's all tannins. And how they work is the, the tannins around the tree, um, insects will eat it and then it, the poor insect, the digestive system will be destroyed. Um, so these are the roses, the blackberry root. Um, you know, I was on a, I was so honored to, to be a co-leader uh, with Rosemary and Rocio and Mimi Hernandez was on that trip. So many great herbalists were on that trip to Ecuador. Um, and there was, um, we had long, long, long bus rides. And so we just didn't want to stop a lot. And, you know, with traveler's diarrhea, obviously you wanted to move, you want to get rid of the infection. Um, but that was the only time that I really, or that was the first time I really saw the deep, deep impact of blackberry root tincture. Um, just to, to get down the road, to get over that mountain, to really astringent. Obviously, chronic diarrhea or long-term diarrhea, you want to get to the source and try to figure out the pathology. But this is a great in a traveler's first aid kit, um, really looking at that. Yarrow is another astringent. Shizandra, uh, we can grow Shizandra. Um, lots of friends on their farms have uh, trellises and trellises of Shizandra. Um, it's sour and warm, and I love what the Chinese say. It secures primal chi so that it does not leak out, and so it's binding and astringing, and I, I love Shizandra. Angel, who works here, makes the best digestive tonic, and she puts um, Shizandra in there just a little bit. It has such a lovely flavor. I use this, I, I use Shizandra a lot in bedwetting formulas, Um and work with nervines, but also um, holding on to boundaries, 
Um, that's what a lot of these are about. This is a lot about boundary work, leaky boundaries, kind of letting things go. Um, so staghorn sumac, here we are. This, so this is, if, if you don't have schizandra, well, you know, you might be all over the world, but for me, um, sumac is such a great astringent. It's very sour, a lot like schizandra, very drying. Um, we'll, we'll add it to elderberry. You know, sometimes, um, you know, when you have phlegm, you know, the, the, the best thing to do when you get sick is just, uh, in some ways, do nothing for the first 24 hours. Just let your body do what it needs to do and then move it. Maybe you want to warm it. Maybe you want to take broths. Maybe you want to rest. Um, but, you know, when you trust your body, your body will step in. We don't want to just be hitting it with herbs right away. And so the same thing with the herbs. When you trust the herbs, um, you don't need massive, massive amounts of them. Um, and so a lot of times we'll put the sumac in with elderberry. If the flu that season happens to be really wet and moist. Um, we'll warm it with ginger, and uh, but a lot of times we will add our local sumac. I will say one thing, if you're drying sumac, really open up the berries because insects love to live inside. They And, and when you harvest it, um, it's usually in late summer or summer time, but you know it's ready when it's sticky. So, you know, go and pull open um, the one of the berry heads and um, seed heads and um, it, you, you'll, you'll want to feel a resin. But then when you bring it home to dry, open it up and just let the critters leave. You can open it up, put it on a screen outside, um, let them leave and then bring it in to dry. There you go. Balance is the key. <laughs> um, you know, and like, as I was saying, homeostasis, um, you know, what is balance? You know, balance is this continuum. Balance is uh, this constant spectrum where we're moving back and forth, but we're really trying to maintain um, that place, the middle way um, that, that our body knows. And, and our state of health is very different. Um, you know, we have normal numbers and 120 over 80, that's basically a 25 year old white male when they got the stats and I've never been there. I'm 90 over 60 women's blood pressure can be lower. So as we're going forward as herbalists and, um, supporters of this medicine, really honoring what is balance, what is a quote unquote normal, um, and really looking to the energetics, really looking to those tissue states. Um, so other places, um, other than what I'm writing, but Kiva Rose writes beautifully about um, tissue states and energetics and Jim McDonald and uh, Rosalie. Um, there's just so many herbalists now moving into the energetic realms because it's so incredibly sensual. So I want to thank you so much for supporting IHS and UPS, and I can't wait uh, to see you all in a couple of years as we move through this um, amazing time. And, you know, the Chinese say the pandemics generally last for two years. Um, so no matter what we do, no matter what intervention, um, hopefully this cycle of nature um, will tend itself um, and move to a really... Um, prosperous place. So anyway, thank you so much. And um, thank you, Kelsey, and the whole team at IHS um, for hosting this great workshop.